everyone, in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about one of the most important topics in all of statistics, and that is the confidence interval. So let's get started. So in the last lecture, we were talking about these very important words, about or around. Now, in this lecture, I'm gonna keep the numbers a little bit easier to work with. So remember that when you calculate an average of 30, that doesn't necessarily mean that the average age of, is 30. It means that the average age is about 30. Now, the purpose of this lecture is to address this really important question. What does about mean? Like, what's close to 30? What's around 30? Now, we can answer that question with what are called confidence intervals. A confidence interval is a range of numbers from one number to another number that likely contains the parameter that we're trying to make an inference about. So the idea is that even though you calculate an average of 30, you can't quite say that the actual average age of the population is 30. You can't make assumptions about the parameter. Confidence intervals can fix that issue. So here's an example of a confidence interval. We can say that the average age is actually somewhere between 28 and 32. So we're trying to capture that actual average. We're not making a claim that the actual average is 30. We're making a claim that the actual average is somewhere between 28 and 32. Well, we actually can't even do that. We can't make a claim that the actual average is between 28 and 32 because it might not be. But what we can do is we can calculate a probability that the actual average age is somewhere between 28 and 32. And if that probability is high, then we might as well just say, good enough, we probably captured it. And that's what confidence intervals do. Now it's important to understand that confidence intervals are trying to capture the true average. But it's also really important to understand that every confidence interval has a probability attached to it. So I can't say with 100% certainty that the actual average is between 28 and 32, because it might not be. But I might be able to say that the probability that the average age be is between 28 and 32 is like 95%, which is really good. Now again, it turns out we can actually calculate what that probability would be. I'm just making up a number. I'm making up a probability here. But we can use mathematics to calculate that probability that is attached to any confidence interval. So let's go through an example of what a real confidence interval would look like. I might say that if I have a 95% confidence interval that's between 28 and 32, that just means that there is a 95% chance that the actual average age is between 28 and 32. Now notice something here. What's between 28 and 32? What's right in the middle there? Well, 30. That's the average that we calculated from our sample. If you remember from the beginning of this lecture, we talked about calculating an average age of 30. But we're not making a claim about what the actual average is. We're making kind of like this region that's trying to capture what the true average is. So I'm not saying the average age is 30. I'm saying it's 30, well, around there, plus or minus 2. So in that case, we're going from 28 to 32. And that plus or minus 2, that 2 is like your margin of error. And if you've ever seen in a poll, uh, it might say the phrase margin of error. That's what it's referring to. It's referring to how far away from their, their calculation um, that they're allowing for, for some error. So that's what margin of error means. And this is what a really good confidence interval looks like. Now, I'm not making a claim that the actual average is between 28 and 32. I'm just 95% certain that's the case. It could be that the actual average age is higher than 32 or lower than 28. I might be wrong, and there's a 5% chance that I'm wrong. But that's kind of a small chance, so scientists are typically okay with that. Now before we move on to the math portion of this lecture, I want to mention a really important point. When you gather your statistic from your sample and calculate an average age of 30, that does not mean that the average age of the population is 30. The reason for that, and we've talked about this a couple times, but I really want to hit this home. The reason is that if 1,000 scientists conduct the same study with different samples, the results are probably going to vary. They're probably going to be different from each other, but they're probably going to be close. And so the solution is not to make claims about what the actual average is. 
The solution is to provide confidence intervals. So let's go through some confidence intervals together. We're going to head over to the computer. So I'll see you there. All right, so we're going to go into some more explicit examples of confidence intervals. There's going to be two portions of this next section of this lecture. Uh, the first portion is to understand what this says right here. Uh, the second portion is to learn how to develop confidence intervals because they're extremely important when you do a test or an experiment. Now, basically, this right here, this 96 comma 102, is actually a region. It is a region. I'm going to use blue to label this region. It is the region between 96 and 102. So it represents a bunch of numbers. In fact, it represents all of these numbers right here between 96 and 102. Basically, what this says is um, I'm 95% confident that the true average is somewhere in here. So um, remember, the whole purpose of statistics is to figure out um, information about the population. And when you're doing experiments, you generally tr tend to calculate averages. And you're trying to get at the population average. And the best way to try to find that population average is through confidence intervals. Confidence intervals basically says, I have these two numbers, 96 and 102. And I'm trying to capture the pop population average. So I don't actually know what the population average is. I'm never going to know that. And that's why we have confidence intervals. That is the entire reason we do confidence intervals is because we accept the fact that we're never going to find the population average. That's not the intention because that would require a census, meaning we would have to sample the entire population. But when we collect a sample, we can guess as to where the population average is. So let me give you real quick an example. Now, there is a technically a problem with this. Um, well, actually, before we go into this example, let me clarify what this 95% means. If this is true, if our 95% confidence interval is between as from 96 to 102, this means that there is a 95% probability that this average is somewhere between here. It could be that, oops, it's not actually here. The actual average is right here. And that would happen with 5%, 5% of the time, because this is a 95% confidence interval. And basically, the, the higher your confidence, um, the more broad your range is. But in, in this case, 95% of the 95% of the 95% confidence intervals will capture the average, and 5% of them won't. So there is a 95% chance that the true average is actually in this region. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I've captured the average. I know where it's at. I know right around where it's at. Because the second I do that, I'm making pretty much a, a claim that, I, that is a fact. It would be considered like a fact, which is not a very good thing to do. So in this case, um, I can't claim that the average is in between 96 and 102. But I can say with 95% certainty that it is. And to scientists, 95% is that like special number that they love. That is good enough. That is confident enough for a lot of people. Now, let's talk about, so that's, an, uh, that's a breakdown of what a 95% confidence interval is. Let's break down how to find one of these things and how they work. This is the second portion of this example lecture here. So here we have, um, let's say you gather a sample and you, get, you have some statistics on the sample. For one, the sample average was like, and let's say we're doing IQ. Um, your sample IQ, average IQ was like 97. And you gathered, let's say 10 people. Now, the population standard deviation for IQ is 
16. Now, how I know that, don't worry about that question. We'll worry about that later. But let's say I wanted to build a 95% confidence interval. Here is the formula for how to do a confidence interval. And this is something that I would write down. So take out a notebook and write this down. This is the formula right here. Basically, we take our average, our sample average, and we're going to add and subtract 1.96 times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So real quick, I'm going to write that actually in big, well, actually, I don't want to delete that. I'm going to write that in the center top here so that you guys can really see it because it's really important to understand and memorize this formula. So I'm going to write it in red because it matters. So confidence interval is going to be my sample average plus or minus 1.96 times my population standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of people I sampled. Now that's how I get those two numbers. I want the, the first number I get when I subtract, the second number I get when I add right here. That's what the plus or minus means. Now we're going to get into a couple of these numbers. First off, this is actually not the formula for the confidence interval. This is actually the formula for the 95% confidence interval. Now 1.96, that number is kind of familiar. If you remember, there was a problem that we had. I'm going to try to draw this really quickly. There was a problem that we had where we were trying to find which Z scores captured the middle 95%. And it turned out it was positive 1.96 and negative 1.96. So this is kind of a flashback to uh, many lectures ago. But the idea is that's how we got that number 1.96. Um, technically, there is a, um, a special notation for this number. It's actually called Z star. Z star represents what's called the critical value. And for 95%, that number is 1.96. Now, we'll talk about how to find Z star later on. Technically, we already do know how to find Z star. It's uh, whatever the solution is to this problem. If you have a certain region here, in this case, it's 95%, but whatever your um, confidence percentage is, confidence interval percent, um, the question is what Z score would give you um, a region between negative Z and positive Z of that percentage. And that is your critical value. But ignore that for now. We'll talk about a faster way. There's actually a chart that gives you this because calculating that is a little tedious. And besides, most of our confidence intervals are going to be 95% confidence intervals. And for that reason, we're actually pretty much just always going to be using 1.96 here. Now, one note about notation, you're probably never going to see this mu sub s. That's actually really rare. A lot of times what people use is x bar, and x bar represents sample average. So my sample average is 97 in this case. So I'm gathering IQs of people, right? I gather 10 people, and I have um, the IQ, and I'm trying to figure out where is this average IQ. What is the true average IQ? I claimed earlier it was 100, but I'm not so sure about that. Well, let's develop our confidence interval here. So our, our average is 97, and then we're going to plus or minus 1.96 times, and the numerator here is going to be 16 divided by the square root of 10. Now we have to be very careful with PEMDAs. We have to do um, this division before the multiplication because of the way I wrote the division. And then we do the multiplication and then we do the addition slash subtraction. So first I'm going to figure out what this is. Now this, by the way, is, is like, so this is the center of my confidence interval. And I'm going to add and subtract from my center to find the, the boundaries of my confidence interval. And this is considered the margin of error. So I know I throw, I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, but 
just keep in mind that I have my center and I'm adding and I'm subtracting. Um, so in both directions and I'm adding this, this error, this uh, region, to, uh, this like dimension to this number 97. I'm not claiming that the actual average is 97. I'm claiming that the actual average is around 97. So let's figure out what the margin of error is. 1.96 times 16 divided by the square root of 10 is 9.92. So this is 97 plus or minus 9.92, which by the way is two numbers. The first number is what I get when I subtract these two. So 97 minus 9.92, which is 87.08. And then the second number is 97 plus 9.92, which is 106.92. And so now I have created a confidence interval. And basically what I'm saying is, if I have this number line, and I have the number 87 and the number 107, those are basically my boundaries, I'm making the claim with 95% accuracy that the actual true uh, average is somewhere in here. And it is, think about it. The average IQ is 100, which is between 87 and 107. So yes, I captured the average. Now, as my sample size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then my margin of error is actually gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. And this region is gonna get smaller and smaller, and I'll be able to capture this average with more accuracy. Because at this point, I don't know what the population average is. I said it's 100, but the only reason I know it's 100 is because of some problems that we did earlier and because IQ is intentionally designed that way. But when we're trying to really capture an average, well, we're gonna run into a couple issues here. Number one, we're never gonna be able to figure out what it is. We're just gonna be able to narrow down that region closer and closer by increasing our sample size. Um, the other problem we're going to run into is, and this is actually a problem with this pro, uh, particular example, this guy right here. Think about this philosophically for a second here. Where did that number come from? Now, this is what happened. You took a sample, you calculated the sample average, you counted the number of people in your sample, which is 10, that you can do. How did you get the population standard deviation? Well, if you rewind this video, you're gonna find out that I actually just gave it to you. Now, how do you, how would you calculate the sample, the, uh, sorry, the population standard deviation? Because you would need to do a census for that. And if you did a census, then there's no reason to try to create a confidence interval because you, know the population average if you calculate this population standard deviation. I mean, the first step in calculating standard deviation, step one, is calculate the population average. So why are you trying to ca capture the population average if you know it? Because if I know the population standard deviation, that would imply I would also know the population average. And so technically, when you conduct a study, you can't find that value. It's not possible. So we're gonna to have to fix this big problem, which we'll fix later on when we get into t-tests. But this is a very big problem. Unfortunately for now, I'm gonna actually be giving you the population standard deviation. And later on, we're gonna fix this problem because really the only thing you can calculate is the sample standard deviation. You can only calculate the standard deviation of whatever sample you collect. You can't calculate the standard deviation of the entire population, unless you do a census. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you in the next video. You just watched a video from Amore Learning. We provide free math videos and we offer many online courses. We also provide free math tutoring via YouTube Live every Thursday and Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video to get access to all of our free content. And put a comment in the comment section if you have any math questions. Check out all of our courses on amorelearning.org.